In this problem, we're going to work with what are called partial orders. We're going to work with R1, which is a partial order on the set A1, and R2, which is a partial order on the set A2. A partial order is nothing but a relation that has three properties. And the three properties are reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive. So R1, when we say R1 is a partial order on A1, really what we're saying is that R1 is a relation on A1, and it's a relation that is reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive. So partial order is really just shorthand for a relation with these three properties. We are going to assume in this problem that we work that A1 and A intersect with A2 is the empty set. That means if X is in A1, it can't be in A2, and if X is in A2, it can't be in A1 because their intersection is empty. And what we are going to show is the following. We're going to show that R1 union R2 union the cross product of A1 with A2, that this is a partial order on the set A1 union A2. So we're going to establish that this is a relation with three properties, reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive, on the set A1 union A2. So to establish that, we're basically just going to work through and show that this quantity has these three properties. So let's go ahead and start with the first property, the reflexive property. So what does it mean to be reflexive in this case? What we need to show if R1 union R2 union A1 cross A2 is reflexive on A1 union A2, that means for all x in A1 A2, we need x comma x to be in R1 union R2 union A1 cross A2. So how can we do that? Well, since we need to show this is true for all x, we need to choose an arbitrary x in A1 union A2. And this means that x is in A1 or x is in A2. And we can now analyze each of these cases independently. And for each one of them, we'll be able to conclude that x comma x is in R1 union R2 union A1 cross A2. So let's look at this first case. x is in A1. Well, if x is in A1, remember, R1 is a partial order on A1. So by the definition of R1 being a partial order on A1, we know that R1 is reflexive. And by definition of R1 being reflexive on A1, that means that for all x in A1, x comma x is in R1. That's what it means to be reflexive, for R1 to be reflexive on A1. Well, if x comma x is in R1, x comma x is definitely in R1 union R2 union A1 cross A2. I can always union on more sets and still remain an element of the set. So in this case, for an arbitrary element in A1 union A2, we've shown that x comma x is in the quantity that we're working with right now, R1 union R2 union A1 cross A2. What about, <clears throat> so we've, we've concluded that x comma x is in this, okay? So we've got this first part. To really draw this conclusion, we also need to make sure this other part checks out, and you can probably see how that's going to work out. If x is in A2, then we know that since R2 is reflexive on A2, that means that x comma x is in, a, in R2, because that's what the definition of R2 being reflexive on A2 means. If x comma x is in R2, then x comma x is definitely in R1 union R2 union A1 cross A2, because we can always add on union more sets. So again, we can get to this bottom conclusion that x comma x is in R1 union R2 union A1 cross A2, so this is reflexive on A1 union A2. So that was the first property we had to show. Let's now tackle the anti-symmetric property. What does it mean to be anti-symmetric? It means that for all x, y that we choose in A1 union A2, that x1, or x comma y in our quantity, R1 union R2 union A1 cross A2, and y comma x in the set implies that x equals y. That's what the anti-symmetry problem or property means. So we need to show that this is true for all x, y on in the set A1 union A2. So if I need to show that's true for all x, y, I need to let x, y be in A1 union A2. And I'm going to choose them such that x comma y is in R1 union R2 union A1 cross A2. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to come up with a few different cases to do the analysis just like before. And in each of these cases, we're going to conclude that x is equal to y. Okay. So first, let's consider the case x in A1 or and y in A1. So basically, there's only so many ways that x and y can be in A1 union A2. One way is for both x and y to both be in the set A1. 
So if a, x and y are both in the set A1, this means that x comma y is in R1 because R1 is a partial order on the set A1. This means that x comma y is not in the set R2 because R2 is only defined on the set A2. It also means that x comma y is not in the set A1 cross A2 because the Cartesian product of A1 and A2 has its first element from the set A1 and the second element, second element from the set A2, and y in this case is from A1, not A2. We also know because x comma y is in R1 and x comma y is in R2, not in R2 that y comma x can't be in R2. Remember, R2 is a partial order on A2, so its elements have to come from A2. Well, in this case, x and y are both from A1, so y comma x can't be in R2. And similarly, we can also conclude that y comma x is not in A1 cross A2 either, because again, A1 cross A2 implies that the first coordinate comes from A1 and the second coordinate comes from A2, but both of my coordinates come from A1. So, let's think about what we're trying to show here. Since a partial order, since I have x comma y in R1, and R1 is a partial order on A1, x comma y in R1 and y comma x in R1 implies that x is equal to y. That's just the definition of a partial order. So let's think about what we're trying to show here. What we need to show is that x comma y in the set and y comma x in the set implies that x is equal to y. Well, for the case that we're working with, the only way that x comma y is in this set and y comma x is in this set for the case that we're working on, x in a1 and y in a1, because of all these things we just listed up here, the only way that this can happen is when x comma y is in R1 and y comma x is in R1, right? Because y comma x can't be in that, y comma x can't be that, okay? So the only way that this case can happen is when x comma y is in R1 and y comma x is in R1. Well, look at this. If that is the case, which it has to be here, that means that x is equal to y because R1 is a partial order on A1. So we can go ahead and draw that conclusion. x comma y has to be in R1 and y comma x has to be in R1. So we have to have x equal to y because R1 is a partial order on A1. So that's case one. Case two, now we're just going to kind of go through the other cases. Going back to the original statement, what's the next kind of option that I have for choosing x and y? I start off with x and y both in A1. Now the next case, we're going to have x in A1 and y in A2. Well, if x is in A1 and y is in A2, that means x comma y is not in R1, because R1 is only on A1. That means that x comma y is not in R2, because R2 is only on A2. I've got a mix of things here. It also means that y comma x is not in R1, again, because I have a mix of coordinate systems here. y comma x is not in R2, and y comma x is not in A1 cross A2, but it can be in the Cartesian product A1 cross A2, because that's how the Cartesian product is defined. x comma y can be in A1 cross A2, because that's just the definition of the Cartesian product. Okay, so let's go back to the logic that we're trying to establish. So if I have this true, so any time x comma y is in R1 union, R2 union, A1 cross A2, and y comma x is in R1 union, R2 union, A1 cross A2, I need to show that when this is true, that x is equal to y. But guess what? This is never true. And it's never true because of what we said up here at the very beginning. We said that I can't be in R1, I can't be in R2, I'm sorry, I'll move back up, I can't be in R1, I can't be in R2, and I can't be in A1 cross A2. So this right side can never be true. So for case 2, x being in A1 and y being A2, this right side here of the AND statement is never going to be true, so we never have to worry about this failing. It's never true, so we never have to worry about being true and not having x equal y. So it's never true, so it never fails to imply x equals y. So we still have anti-symmetry holding 
in this case. Okay, case three is going to look pretty similar. We're going to just kind of flip flop. Now we're going to have x and a2 and y and a1. So what does this mean? That means that x comma y is not in R1, x comma y is not in R2, x comma y is not in the Cartesian product. Okay, so this violates our assumption that we picked x comma y in the original R1 union R2 union A1 cross A2. If we had not assumed that and we just wrote down this statement again, we see that the left hand side of it is going to fail. So again, we could also conclude that this statement will never be true, so it can never fail to imply x equals y. So that would be another way to reason through. Okay. So case three is, is not something we have to worry about. This is not a valid case to, to look at. And then finally case four, let's take a look at that. So we did a1, 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 a2, a2, a1. Now finally we need to do a2, a2. So if x is in a2 and y is in a2, that means that x comma y is in r2. That x comma y is not in r1. It means that x comma y is not in the Cartesian product. It means that y comma x is not in r1. And it means that y comma x is not in the Cartesian product. Remember, when we're dealing with the partial order r2, we always have this as true because r2 is a partial order on a2. So now let's look at the statement we're trying to establish. <clears throat> so x, x comma y and r2 is the only way that the left-hand side and the right-hand side can both be true because of what we listed up here. So for the case that we're considering, this statement true means that x comma y is in R2 and y comma x in R2. But because we have a partial order, that means that x is equal to y. So we've enumerated all the cases. Okay, so all the cases hold. They either directly imply what we wanted to show, x equals y, or they can never fail to imply that. So all the cases hold. So R1 union R2 union A1 cross A2 is anti-symmetric on A1 union A2. Okay, so that's the second property about anti-symmetry done. And now finally, the transitive property. Even more complicated now, the transitive property says that for all x, y, z in A1 union A2, we need x, y in the set and y, z in the set to imply that x, z is in the set. This is what it means to be transitive. So this is what we need to show is true for all x, y, z in A1 union A2, and again, we're going to tackle this by cases. We need to show this is true for all x, y, z. So we let x, y, z in a1 union a2. And we assume that we have x, y in this set and y, z in this set. And we need to show that when this is true, this implies that x, z is in the set. So let's enumerate all the possible ways for this logic to be true. Case one, and there's going to be nine of them in this case. So one way that this can be true is x comma y is in R1 and y comma z is in R1. That's one way that we can make this and statement be true. So since R1 is a partial order, x comma, this implies that x comma z is in R1 because R1 is a partial order and both of the things that I'm dealing with are in R1. So I get to apply the properties of the partial order R1 directly to easily conclude that x comma z is in R1. If x comma z is in R1, then it's definitely in the union of some other things, and that's the conclusion we wanted to get to. Right? We want to get to this conclusion right here. x comma z is in R1 union R2 union A1 cross A2. So that was case one. Case two, we're going to let x, y in R2 and y, z in R2. Well, again, R2 is a partial order, so this implies that x comma z is in R2, and again, I can easily conclude that x comma z is in the full thing, so that establishes case two. So, so far, both these cases, everything's held. Case three, x comma y in a1 cross a2, and x and y comma z in a1 cross a2. <clears throat> so here's one important piece we haven't used yet that's very important here. The intersection of a1 and a2 is empty. And this being empty is very important. <clears throat> 
Based on x comma y being in the Cartesian product a1 comma a2, that means that y is in a2, and y is in a1, based on this starting assumption right here, right? If x comma y is in a1 cross a2 and y comma z is in a1 cross a2 from the first statement, this part, that implies y is in a2. From this part, this implies that y is in a1, but we know that this is not possible. It's not possible for y to be in a2 and a1. So actually case 3 is not a case we have to worry about. Case 3 can never occur if the original statement we're working with is going to be true. So case 3 is not possible, so we have to worry about that. Case 4, we're going to let x comma y be in r1 and y comma z be in r2. Well, from this first part, this implies that y is in a1. From this second part, that implies that y is in a2, because this right here, y comma z, is an element of r2, and r2 is a partial order on a1, so that means y must be from a, I'm sorry, r2 is a partial order on a2, so that must mean that y is in a2, but again, this is not possible. We can't have y in a1 and y in a2, because a1 intersect a2 is the empty set, so again, not possible. So we can never fail to imply xz is in the set, based on this case, Case 5, x comma y in R1, y comma z in A1 cross A2. So the first statement says that x is in A1. The second statement says that z is in A2, which says that x comma z is in A1 cross A2, right? And we can union that with as many things as we want. So here we've been able to conclude that x comma z is in R1 union R2 union A1 cross A2. So that case holds. Case 6, x comma y is in R2, y comma z is in R1, which means that y is in A2, y is in A1, which is not possible. So case 6 is not a possible case, so this case will never fail to imply x comma z in R1 union R2 union A1 cross A2. So that will never happen. Case 7, we're getting there. x, y, and R2, y, z in the cross product. Well, the first thing, x comma y in R2 implies that y is in A2. The second statement implies that y is in A1. Again, this is not possible. So this, this case checks out. This will never fail to imply x comma z when that original statement is true. Case 8, x comma y is in the cross product. y comma z is in R1. This says that y is in A2 from the first statement and y is in A1 from the second. Again, not possible. So this checks out. And then finally, case 9. x comma y in the cross product and y comma z in R2. So what does the first part say? x comma y in the cross product says that x is in A1. The second statement, y comma z in R2, says that z is in A2. Well, if x is in A1 and z is in A2, that means that x comma z is in the cross product, or the Cartesian product, which means that x comma z unioned with a bunch of stuff is also in this set. So this case holds as well. So we've enumerated all cases, and for every single case that we've looked at, whenever x comma y is in R1 union, R2 union, A1 cross A2, or Cartesian product, and yz is in the set, whenever that statement is true, every single time we've been able to conclude that xz is in the same set. Okay? We did find a lot of cases where this statement can't be true, okay? But that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in whenever this is true, it must imply x comma z is in R1 union, R2 union, A1 Cartesian product A2. Okay? And that's what we've done. Every single time that statement was true, we were able to show x comma z was in it. So this is a transitive partial order. All right, so we're basically done. We have shown that R1 union, R2 union, A1 cross A2 on the set A1 union, A2 is reflexive, we've shown that it's anti-symmetric, and we've shown that it's transitive. It has all these properties. So that means that R1 union R2 union A1 Cartesian product A2 is a partial order on A1 union A2. And that is the end of the problem.